wanted to make another quick Calvinism destroyed video, not because I'm on a quote crusade against Calvinism, but more because I'm following the biblical commands to expose false doctrine, to shine light on darkness, and to bring every thought captive uh, to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. And obviously we all want to be in the truth. Uh, one, one thing that really bothers me having come out of Calvinism is just how many uh, blatant inconsistencies and quote-unquote paradoxes you're forced to accept in that system. Things that you'll sweep under the rug and you'll put in the back of your mind and you're expected to just gloss over it and say, well, we can't reconcile that. Yet, I suspect God is more saying, how do you not see the truth? Why, why would you do this? You know, Perhaps your understanding of a couple of verses, a handful of verses, maybe even a dozen verses, is slightly off rather than very, very clear scripture all over the place about the heart of God and his desire to see all people saved. The Bible says he's not willing to any should perish, but all should come to repentance. And that the Bible says he would have all men to be saved. These, these things are clear. He's a propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. These, these verses are clear. They're not paradoxical. Um, and we run across something really strange here in Romans 9 to 11. I point out elsewhere, but I wanted to make into a condensed video here. The heart of Paul is so clear in Romans 9 to 11. Romans 9 to 11, I just did a video on it. And so I wanted to touch again on this while it's on my mind. Um, it's about the nation of Israel. Why did Israel reject Jesus? Why did Israel not receive certain promises what's going on here and does israel have a future that's the clear point and purpose of romans 9 to 11. in the midst of that the heart of paul for the nation of israel for his people the israelites is manifest and you see really clearly he says i say the truth in christ i lie not my conscience also bearing me witness in the holy ghost that i have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart for I wish that myself were cursed from Christ my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. For my brethren, rather. So what Paul is saying here is he could wish that he was damned, that he was accursed for his brethren, his kinsmen according to the flesh. Um, now note here, um, you know, replacement theologians, people who don't know how to you know, read the Bible or are not willing to accept what the Bible teaches about the future for the nation of Israel. They, they are really quick to try to make Israel mean church or something stupid. But here, there's no twist in this. The kinsman according to the flesh, he's clearly talking about Israelites. That's what he says in verse 4, who are Israelites. So he's talking about the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, ethnic Israel. And he's saying that he wishes he was damned. Now, as you follow the flow of Romans 9, it talks about, really, at the end, I can go down. It talks about why they didn't receive it and why the Gentiles did. It says, what shall we say then? That the Gentiles followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, right? Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? That's a key. This is, this is a huge key to the entire text. Where? Wherefore? Why? Therefore? Why? What? What's the reason? Why? Because they sought it not by faith. It's not because they weren't predestined. It's because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone, and we know that stumbling stone is Jesus Christ. And um, you can continue on. In the next chapter. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And so my question is simply this. How on earth does the Holy Spirit bear witness through the Apostle Paul and give him heaviness and continual sorrow, wishing himself accursed for his brethren, when Jesus Christ, according to Calvinists, never wished these people saved, the Father never wished these people saved, and Jesus never become accursed in their place on the cross? Does that make any sense to you? Is the Apostle Paul more loving than Jesus Christ? If the Apostle Paul wished himself accursed in the place of these unbelieving Israelites, how much more would the Lord of glory? 
do you not see how you have to bring down God in order to hold up Calvinism? Is it not clear? You have to make the Apostle Paul desire more people saved than God. And I know where Calvinists would run here and, and try to defend their sins, but just focus on this. Can you allow yourself to think and reason from the scripture? Paul is not more loving than God. Paul <laughs> does not wish himself a curse for people that Jesus didn't die for. This this would be not only inconsistency in that God's obviously, he is love, is what the Bible says. And we also know here in his love that he died for us, right? And so we know the crucifixion is a manifestation of, of God's love toward us. And we see that through that. And if the, if the cross is not for all people, if there's not propitiation made provisionally for all people, then we know that basically God doesn't love everybody. But here we see Paul loves people that Romans 9 makes clear they wasn't saved. They, and a lot of them were cut, cut off. He talks about how they were basically reprobated and blinded. And so they're, they're given up, they're given over, but in time, God desired them to be saved. He drew them to be saved, and they said no. And so eventually, God might say no to them. But see, that still that doesn't cut off the fact that, that God did love them, that God did desire them, just as Paul does here. There's a consistency there, and there's consistency within the Trinity. Here you'd have to have the Holy Spirit bearing witness through Paul with heaviness and sorrow, causing Paul to wish himself accursed for Israel, who in mass rejected Jesus and went to hell. But Paul is led to wish himself a curse for them. This is bizarre. Is the Holy Spirit doing something that the Father and the Son isn't doing? Like, how do you work that out? I honestly don't think there is a good way of working it out. This is why even good Bible teachers, well-respected ones like John MacArthur, as they preach through Romans 9, they'll come to the end and say, here's the other side of salvation. Here's the other. No, it's consistent throughout. The Bible's not paradoxical. There's, there's not paradoxes at every corner. Uh, your doctrine creates paradoxes, rather contradictions. And the Apostle Paul is not more loving than Jesus Christ is, to be sure. Another thing that contradicts uh, Calvinism out of Romans 9 to 11, very clearly, is this, this what most people today would call, you're being humanistic. I've said it to people. I've been really against it. And I still am against very humanistic, naturalistic means to try to get people saved, trying to trying to get emotions you know, stirred. You, you can't trick people into getting saved. But, but, what does the Bible say about Israel in relation to the Gentiles? Well, Paul said that he magnifies his office, right? If by any means he may provoke to emulation them which are of, are my flesh, talking about Israel, and might save some of them. So Paul believes that he could provoke by showing people the glories of Jesus Christ, by showing people how good the Gentiles now have it through, through Christ. He might provoke them to jealousy. And that's what the Bible talks about, provoking Israel to jealousy. Uh, that's what verse 11 says. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Are we covenant theologians? Or is God cast out, cast off Israel? Should we be a replacement theology? Should, have they fallen for good? God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation has come into the Gentiles to provoke them, being Israel, to jealousy. Well, what is this about being provoked to jealousy so that some of them might be saved if the only way that someone can be saved is by this mysterious inward calling that comes and you're born again before you ever believe, uh, regeneration preceding faith. So that's really the way that anybody's provoked to salvation is by the new birth. But see, the Bible teaches you can actually be drawn and your will can be provoked through the truth of Christ, through the glories and riches of Jesus Christ, through the glories of the gospel, you can be provoked and then your will stirred to make a decision for Jesus Christ. Such talk is anathema with Calvinists, but not with the Bible. And so we need, we need to ask ourselves the question, does this jive with Calvinism? The answer is no. 
So as a Bible student, as someone who takes scripture seriously, how can you reasonably come through these texts and take them in any meaningful fashion, in any real way? Uh, how, how can you really apply these things without totally contradicting your system? Um, and then lastly, what on earth? Remembering now that Paul began with great heaviness and sorrow in his heart, wishing himself accursed for Israel. How on earth can Paul then end the, the discourse on this subject with proclamation of just glory to God? Oh, the depth and the riches of both uh, riches of both the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who hath been his counselor? For who hath first given to him? And it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things. To glory be forever. Amen. So, what causes Paul to bust out into praise? Well, for one, the future salvation of the nation of Israel. That's why. He realizes the hope of the nation of Israel. He realizes that one day God is going to provoke them uh, to salvation. God is going to do a mighty work in Israel in the end times. And they are going to turn to, to Christ in faith. And they are going to look on him who they pierced. And so he this right here explicitly refutes um, the doctrine of replacement theology and and all that nonsense with covenant theology. But even even so, we see that Paul realizes there is hope even for a remnant within the nation of Israel today, that they can still be saved today. They're not totally hardened or reprobated as, as a whole still. It's blindness has come across them in part. It is hard for them to be saved. They they are, uh, as it, the Bible says, there's a blindfold over their eyes even to the day as they read Moses. They don't, they don't realize what the Bible is really saying in the Old Testament, what it's really talking about. They don't see that it's all pointing to Jesus. But Paul realizes that there is hope not only now, but ultimately in the future. And it's a good place to, to end this short video on. And I would I would simply call my Calvinist friends, if I have any, or people who are still stuck in that system. It's a false system. And you know, I, I'm not on a crusade against any person uh, necessarily. I'm on a crusade, if anything, for truth. And what I really want is for people to honor God and for God to get the glory he deserves. He died for all, the just for the unjust. He loves all men. He desires all men to be saved and teaching that he rejects people before the foundation of the earth, teaching that he hates people before they're born, having this inconsistent theology where you're reading uh, hardcore Calvinism into one passage and twisting it and contorting it, how, you, how it fits your system. And then you come across clear verses that totally contradict your system where you have Paul being more loving than Jesus. That's not honoring to God. And God in heaven is watching you as you do this. He's watching you as you preach this. He's listening to you and you're grieving him. It's a form of idolatry. He's saying, you're lying about me. And I, I would just, I would, I would ask you, please consider the clear testimony of scripture in so many places. And is it not possible that you have simply misunderstood a few easy to misunderstand passages that, hey, Peter says there's some stuff in Paul that's hard to understand. And we ought not warp the character and nature of God in light of that. Are you willing to eat crow? Are you, are you willing to suffer a, a blow to your pride and admit you was wrong? Are you willing to say that you, you messed up, that you got something wrong? Not many people are. Not many Calvinists change their mind. But my hope and my prayer is that as people come across videos such as this, that they will re-examine how their system of theology has actually diminished the glory of God. They're actually casting darkness on the love of God. The love of God manifests to all men. The heaviness and sorrow that's on God's heart as people reject him, as he draws them, that, that, that's watered down and diminished in Calvinism. Well, he doesn't really want them all saved. He doesn't really, you know, pay for their sins through Christ. It's only the elect that have their paid, sins paid for. That is not glorifying to God. So reconsider your position today, please. Um, and until next time, God bless.